Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's virtual, virtual session. My name is Rebecca Cherry and I'm part of the marketing team here at Laird All. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the session, please share them via the Q&A feature that can be found at the bottom of your screen. We will be monitoring them throughout the webinar and we will have time for questions at the end. Today's recording will be emailed to you after the session is over to watch on demand. Now, I would like to introduce the moderator, Andrew Kristopic. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Kristopic. I'm the Senior Content Marketing Manager for Laird All Medical. And it's my privilege to welcome everybody online today. We had over 675 people signed up for, uh, for this webinar today and I can see that people are still joining. If you're new to Laird All, our mission is helping save lives. We pursue that mission by bringing you the best in class in patient simulators, clinical scenarios, video feedback systems, and on-site service. And we're privileged to be able to represent, uh, represent ourselves to uh, hospitals across the nation, and across the world, nursing schools, pre-hospital care, and of course our nation's military. So if you're representing any of those groups today, as, uh, as you join us, welcome, thank you. We're glad to have you aboard. Now I'm gonna introduce our guest speakers today. First, uh, Mark Henry, Dr. Mark Henry, Professor and Chairman for, of Stony Brook Medicine's Department of Emergency Medicine. Next is David Cohen. David is the Associate Dean of Student Affairs and Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the Renaissance School of Medicine at Stony Brook University. And Andrew Wackett, Dr. Andrew Wackett, Vice Dean of Undergraduate Medical Education and the Director of the Clinical Simulation Center at Stony Brook. And he's also a Clinical Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine there at Stony Brook. So welcome all of you. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, it's great to have you on board. We're gonna give you a chance just to welcome, um, welcome everybody here and, and give a shout out to Stony Brook and say hi to some of your colleagues that are that are hopefully watching. So who wants to take the lead and tell us about Stony Brook's program? I can uh, talk a little bit about it. So um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm involved in running the, the School of Medicine, the Medicine School of Medicine. And um, we have a, a medical school that has about 136 students per year. Um, our students go through three phases of their medical education. And an important part of the transition to each of those phases are really uh, clinical simulation exercises. It gives the students a chance to really um, bolster their skills before they actually translate that to actual patient care. Wonderful, thank you, Andrew. So why don't we introduce our, our topic today? Um, so if you registered for, for this topic, you're in the right place. How to use simulation to mitigate risk during staff onboarding. So that's what we're gonna spend the next uh, 45 minutes uh, speaking about, and then we're going to take audience questions. I just want to reemphasize, if you have questions as we go through, please put them in the Q&A feature because we're going to um, forge ahead to make sure that we, we have a chance to answer your questions today. We're going to get to a polling question, but before we get to that polling question, we, we need to set the uh, framework for that. So what we're about to look at here in the next slide, is the learning curve, right? I think everybody online is, is probably familiar with the learning curve. We all go through it all the time. When we went through it as, as children, we went through it in our education, uh, educational backgrounds. We, we go through it at work. We go through it anytime we encounter something new, maybe even in our hobbies and the things we do outside of work. And on the left, we have the incremental growth in practice and experience. And on, on the uh, bottom axis, we have time. And if you notice that the, at the left is, is where the learning curve typically is, is steepest. Well, from a healthcare perspective and from, what we're, from the perspective of what we're talking about today, that translates into the patient risk curve. And whoops, went just a little too, too quick there. Um, the patient risk curve. So if we consider that every data point without simulation, and I'll, I'll see if uh, Dr. Dr. Henry agrees with this, uh, every, every point without simulation, every data point is a human life. Would you, would you agree with that, Mark? 
Well, I uh, want to translate this another way. That's sure. patient risk. That's also gathering expertise, that same curve. And people have said that regardless of um, what your skill set is, whether you're a tennis player, you're Tiger Woods, you're the great golfer when you're like young man, um, violinist, chess player, doctor, nurse. To become an expert, it takes about 10 years of experience. And, you know, what's true here is, is that the outcome from what we do are people's health, safety, and lives. Because the simulation is perfect for low frequency, high risk events that you don't see many times in actual practice that you've only read about. Um, and and Andrew, I see, I oh, I'm sorry, doctor. The other point I wanna make with this curve is what's interesting when people talk about gathering expertise is for the master chess players, this is certainly true over time, but it starts to come down as they get older. And when you ask people, well, how is that? Why is that? Because there's not as much practice as they get older in their careers. So this is a pretty true curve. And uh, Andrew, I see you uh, nodding your head. So <clears throat> would you agree that we've isolated where the, the initial highest risk tends to be there, there at the beginning? I, I do. I think that you know, early on is where the, the steepest part of the learning curve is. It's the steepest part of the risk curve is as well. And I think the more practice that you can give to your early learners at that point, uh, it, it's going to help you out tremendously. Excellent. And, and of course, this curve repeats itself all the time. It, it never really truly plateaus off. This is just a snapshot in time. Uh, but anytime somebody encounters something new, this, this curve will repeat itself over again. So why don't that sets the stage for our polling question for our audience. And that polling question <clears throat> should hopefully have come up on everybody's screen right now. <clears throat> so here's a brief exercise. Check your favorite situation where you think simulation can reduce patient risk along the learning curve. So think of that learning curve and choose your favorite here that can reduce risk. Anything regarding medication errors, medication errors is always perennial favorite, a change in care protocol or equipment, addressing a past sentinel event or a near miss, important to get both of those, onboarding new clinical staff, and that can be new nurses, new residents, new PAs, and so forth, or all of it because I wanna be a risk reduction warrior. And we're seeing the, I'm seeing smiles online uh, 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 by our, our uh, panelists and I'm, I'm uh, we're seeing the numbers really cr climb here. So good, so the winner is all of it because I wanna be a risk reduction warrior. So that tells us where everybody wants to be. 80% of the people uh, chose that. And then the, um, the follow-up, which is kind of interesting, onboarding new clinical staff, new nurses, new residents. And of course, this is our topic. I was a little surprised on medication errors, but those are all of course lumped into um, all of it because I wanna be a risk reduction warrior. So that's, that's our leader. And that's uh, gonna set the stage for what we're gonna talk about now. So for all you risk reduction warriors, let's go to the next slide, please. There we are. So panelists, is the, the July effect still a risk? And before, we, before, before you answer that, I wanna cite just briefly some two statistics that I thought were kind of interesting. The Journal of General In Internal Medicine did a study, now this is back in 2010, okay? But they looked at, a, they looked at data over almost a 30 year period and they saw a 10% increase every July in, in their data sets over time, a 10% increase in medication errors amongst new residents for that first month of July. Now that was of course in 2010. Also another study, different, different clinical topic. In 2013, the Journal of Medicine concluded that among low risk, this is low risk myocardial infarction patients, low risk, there was a 22.7% 
increase in the mortality rate. During the month of July, these patients were being treated um, by new residents as, as part of the team, of course, that was treating those patients. So those are, those are earlier studies. A lot's happened since 2010. A lot's happened since 2013. But back to our question, is the July effect still a risk? Go ahead, David. You, you want to sure. take it? Go for it. Sure, sure. I think the, the two graphs you showed earlier speak to, the, speak to the July effect. I mean, historically, July was thought to be a, a time of increased risk to patients because you had this giant influx of new residents who were new graduates, medical school graduates who lacked just practical hands-on experience and, and context. Um, so I, I think there is a risk there, especially when you're dealing in, in high acuity situations where acting quickly is, is important. I think having a, a standardized approach to onboarding and using simulation can mitigate that risk. Okay, wonderful. And I see, Andrew, you're shaking your head. You, you agree. And, I'm, and Mark, you've got something to say. Go for it, please. Well, you know, I remember my first July. That was years ago, I will say. Um, but I was an internal medicine intern. There was no emergency medicine residencies in New York that year. And um, they put me in the ER for my first month. And I remember seeing patients and I'd say, whoa, you know, what's going on here? I go get the second year resident and say, Bob, what's going on here? He says, oh, it's that Mark, you know, next week I'd ask him again. Finally, he came to me and said, you know, Mark, you know, I'd like to help you, but we're really busy here. You got to carry your own weight. And I said to myself, are you kidding me? I just got out of medical school and these people are really sick here. I, I actually had thoughts about stopping, just dropping out. I'm not ready to do this. And I sort of made a promise then that if I was ever in a position, uh, I would let that happen to other new graduates. And uh, that, that's kind of what we have introduced at Stony Brook. It was out of my own personal experience. So that's a great segue into uh, now discussing what your program looks like, because that program looks, the program that new residents go through now looks a lot different from um, the world of, of uh, well, an earlier day. A lot's changed even in the, in the past um, 10 years. So let's, let's first talk, we're gonna go real high level and then get down to some specifics, but from a physical standpoint, and we're looking at a photo here from your, um, from your sim lab there at Stony Brook. Tell us please what physical assets you have. What are you, what are you doing uh, in, in this photo? For example, we could use this as a benchmark. What are you, what are you doing to um, create the environment that you wanna, wanna achieve for your new residents? So maybe tell us, go ahead, Andrew. It looks like yeah, you wanna take mean, this, go for it, please. I would say, first of all, I mean, this is a, a very different picture than what you know, many of us had seen when we trained years, years back. We didn't have simulation. And I think the, the added value to simulation is just tremendous. You know, for our medical students, towards the end of their training, we really prep them at the end to be ready for those first days as an intern. And then when our new residents come in, we do the same thing. We, we give them some time to really get comfortable with those cases that Mark was talking about earlier, you know, those things you don't see that frequently, but are such, um, you know, difficult cases to handle and you have to be really, really ready for it. So yeah, I think that's what it comes down to. Simulation, repetition, debriefing, all of that's really important to get everyone up to uh, speed. So there may be some people online that have never seen this this type of environment. So we've got someone working controls is, is the, um, person at the microphone speaking as the simulator or is she speaking to the clinicians in the room? Uh, also, maybe you could tell us what you have in terms of simulators there in the background and, and also whether you're recording all of this when a simulation is going on. Go, go ahead, David. Sure, so that's actually Dr. Otterness. She's one of our EM attendings and it looks like she's running the simulation for a group of the new residents. So she's actually talking to them as the, probably the patient and also acting as the nurse and any other support staff. And she's also, looks like she's also controlling the simulation. So with that laptop on her right, she can actually change the parameters on the monitor, heart rate, blood pressure, pulse ox, et cetera. On the left, she has a computer 
that she can put up images. And you can see there's a, it looks like a chest X-ray and I know the case, so I know it's a tamponade case that she's showing. You can see the cardiomegaly there. And, and she's running that whole thing. She has a microphone in her hand that she's talking with. And there's a speaker also on her right that she's hearing uh, the students and residents interact. Very good. So and she's actually talking behind a one-way mirror. So she, the, she can see them and they can't see her in the control room. And I see some task trainers in the background, but I also see a, a, a high fidelity simulator. So you've got a balance. You've, you're able to, to test people's skills, but then you're also able to test, to see, you're able to see how people respond to the actual responses in the simulator and, and how right. the simulator reacts. Right. Exactly, if we have multiple people running the sim, for instance, if the person might meet it, need an IV, we'll have them use a task trainer for the IV while the other remain, remaining people in the group are running the case. Okay, very good. So let's move now to the next, uh, the next step, which is how you're actually approaching um, teaching. And I, I love the fact that you're comparing this to, to days past, okay, and to your own experiences. So what teaching methods are you using? What teaching approach? Could you please comment on, um, certainly you're going to talk about simulation, uh, but also are you doing this in situ? Are you keeping it all in the lab itself? How much emphasis do you put on debriefing versus the, the simulation? What's, what's your general cadence and approach to, to how you're teaching your new residents? I think the biggest change is that we've made the learning so much more active than it once was, where in the past you'd sit back and passively listen to someone ramble on. Now you can learn all of that ahead of time, or at least the background, and now you can use the simulation lab as a case to practice. So how much time do we spend doing the actual case and how much do we spend debriefing? It really depends. You know, if the, if, if the simulation itself is very complicated, you may spend more time in simulation. But if the real learning points can be picked up simply from simulation then have to be delved in more deeply during the debriefing, you may focus more time on that. You brought up the in situ versus in the lab. That, that's another huge part. I think that an important part of, of simulation is try to replicate your real environment as much as possible. And oftentimes the best way to do that is to bring the simulation to the real environment. And it makes people take it more seriously and really get a whole lot more out of it. So, so during the month long program, we'll, we'll incorporate all those aspects. I mean, I think most of the simulations probably happen in the clinical skill center, but we do a number of them in site too as well. So a couple of, of other, uh, just a few other questions to, to continue here for a moment. The, the balance between didactic and simulation, what is it today? What was it in your personal experience? I, I mean, when, when Drew and I went through the, this July course, it was probably 100% didactics, whereas now for our transition to residency course for the medical students, and the, and the residency um, introduction course, it's probably less than 50% didactics. We have procedural state sessions and simulation sessions. And uh, just, uh, I'm, we're gonna go to the next slide in just a moment, but the ratio roughly in situ versus uh, lab, uh, Mark, wants to, Mark, Mark wants to make a comment before we get there. Go ahead, Mark, please. Well, you know, I, I uh, got out of residency in 78 and medical school in 74. So we had resusciannies, you know, but actually the first ACLS course where it was organized didn't come out till 75. Like the medics were doing it like before the doctors because they had a, they had a program, they were applying skills. So it's really, it's really evolved. We use that as much as we, we could, but as we all know, things have, things have changed. And I, I like what Andrew said, it's active learning. You got a situation, you got to do something. Sure. And, uh, that, that makes a big difference. So we'll underscore that uh, about active learning and we'll use that as, as an opportunity to, to go to the next slide and the next question. So. As you look at the experience of your new residents, 
do you see a transformation and what does that transformation look like? Yeah, we, we do, you know, and I think that when they first start, they're really passive. They're not good at communicating. They're very reticent to take on the leadership role and their, le their level of confidence is, is low. And through repetition and success with simulations and debriefing and gaining a better understanding, it just it grows. I mean, that learning curve you showed earlier, it, it, it paints the perfect picture. I mean, you see how quickly they can develop these, these skills when you orchestrate it properly. And the confidence. It's really, it's nice to see them develop that in such a short time. And Mark, if you, are you envious of, uh, of the new residents going through now? You talked about your experience, which is very much being thrown in the 30 foot deep side of the pool. Uh, are you seeing something that is, is just radically different in the experience of, of the new residents today versus the world that that you experienced when you went through? Yeah, absolutely. Residency. Absolutely. It's sort of a promise I made to the future doctors if I had any influence. And uh, it's what, you know, I wish I had. It's, uh, it's, it's a, you know, emergency medicine is something where your diagnosis and treatment often go on simultaneously because of the time sensitive nature of people's illness or injury. And their response to treatment can, or lack of response to a treatment you initiate can help you make the next turn in the road. Sure. Because it gives you feedback right away. So, you know, this idea that, you know, you come in as individuals, um, maybe anxious about your own background, throwing in with, you know, another 15 people, and now you're going to be on the floor taking care of people. Um, it's transformative to them because we, often act like a team and you see that what you're being taught is something that you may lead or you may follow instructions on. Um, there are options, you know where the equipment is, um, you, you can interchange in your roles and you go from feeling isolated to being part of a, a, a unit, a, a part of a body of people who have the same intent. Sure. And we're going to get to that in uh, just a bit when we talk about one of your one of the scenarios that that you do that teaches good teamwork and communications. I'd like to pause, please, for just a moment, and we're going to move away from the world of new residents and talk about another world that can possibly benefit. And we frankly, we know that's, that, that this world benefits in some sectors from this, but it's the world of of new nurses. So can this approach, this, and, and before I actually ask the question, let me, let me go back to some statistics that I'd like to, to just mention um, to tee this up. So we're seeing an, uh, just a, a, a terrible, for lack of a better word, a terrible uh, attrition rate, turnover rate in nursing in, in America. When it comes to new nurses, onboarding new nurses, the, the common statistic has been for the past few years, 17 to 20% turnover rate during the first year. Walters Clore just released, uh, didn't just release, it's fair, it's, it was a study released in 2017. One of their studies showed a, a new nurse graduate turnover of roughly 30% which is costly, it's, it creates patient risk, of course, and it's, it's terrible for that student who really works so hard to come into the, the healthcare system and wants to make a difference. One of the root causes is, has been underscored in numerous studies, the onboarding process. So could this approach that you're using to onboard new res residents be used for new nurses, the same type of cadence, the same type of, of simulation exposure. Any comments on that? I, absolutely. I, in an ideal world, I think combining the two residents and nurses together is, is the best. We do a number of interdisciplinary sims, simulations that are wonderful. And it just brings out the, the teamwork and the communication piece and it makes everyone feel more comfortable. So I, I think it would be a great idea to use with really onboarding any type of new staff. Because what you're really approaching, and Andrew, I think you want to say something and then we'll come to you, Mark. Um, 
you're really it's it's about simulation it's not necessarily about the type of student that's going through the simulation it's the concept of um uh, active learning and debriefing to get someone to the next level so andrew you wanted to make a comment yeah i was going to say all of us in healthcare we know that we are only successful because of our team. You know, we, none of us can do this in our individual fields. So I think doing the simulation as a part of the team is, is the way to go. And we all, we all stress out about this, you know, doing this uh, inter-team play, it's so difficult, but it's really not. You really just need to gather the bodies and throw them in together and they figure it out. And more importantly, they figure out where their, their faults lie. And you could point those out and people get, get better from it. Sure. And the, the simulations are so much more realistic when you have all the players there. Good point. Very good point. And yeah. enter enter uh, disciplinary learning, right? Yeah. Mark, you had a comment? We do use this approach for new nurse hires in the ER. There we are. There we are. So why don't we move to a polling question? Because after that polling question, we're going to get into um, what everyone I, I guarantee on the line is gonna love, which is the simulations that you're doing. So here's our next polling question. In the, to in the context of mitigating risk to patients, which of these would be your priority? Patient assessment errors, medication errors, use of equipment and basic procedural errors, teamwork and communications, maintaining a cultural safe, uh, culture of safety across disciplines. And teamwork and communications and maintaining a culture of safety across disciplines are kind of heavyweight boxers going at each other right now. I'm seeing the numbers flash back and forth. I don't, I don't know if you're all seeing this, but it looks like maintaining a culture of safety across disciplines is going to win. And voila, it did at 52%. However, for 34% of, of those viewing rated teamwork and communications. That's refreshing to that's refreshing to hear. I think both are refreshing to hear. So that those polling questions just teed up the the rest of our program before we take audience questions because we're going to go through you're going to talk through a scenario that touches on each of these. So, here we go. What simulations uh in do your new residents experience. And I believe the very first one is patient assessment errors. So why don't we go to patient assessment errors and who would like to talk about the, the sim that you do for that? I, I could talk about that okay. one. You know, I think that a real common patient assessment error is, um, is anchoring. You know, a patient presents a certain way and the, um, a, a diagnosis comes to your mind early on. You know, we, we do a case of um, sepsis, you know, a patient who presents with septic shock but there is a uh, adrenal insufficiency in the backdrop of that. So the, uh, the learners can address the septic shock scenario, you know, follow all the typical algorithms. The patient still doesn't get better. And it's not until they recognize that, you know, wait, wait a minute, you know, sepsis is not the only thing going on here. There were some clues that this patient was also suffering from adrenal insufficiency, that they can now jump in, add steroids to the mix, and, and the patient will, will start to improve. What advice, uh, David, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. No, I think that, okay. that's, a, that's pretty straightforward, I think. Sure. So if someone wanted to create this scenario, any advice for them on um, do's and don'ts? I, I, I'm Things about becoming too complex, maybe oversimplified. Yeah, understanding your learning so. objectives. What, what, go ahead. Um, let's let's uh, go to Andrew and then Mark will we'll take your comment, please. Yeah. So if, if you have a case like that, I think uh, the real key behind it is to, um, you know, decide what your major learning point is from it. So if you're in, in the case that I described, if your major learning point was allowing your learners to identify a patient with um, adrenal insufficiency, for instance, what you can do is you can create a situation that it would fall into, such as septic shock. Present the case like a typical patient would be, so you almost trap them to lock into that diagnosis. But make one thing a little different. The uh, potassium is high, the sodium is low. You know, they, they get a lab value back. And hopefully a light bulb will go off. If it doesn't go off, after the simulation is completed in the debriefing, you can now you know, put the emphasis on that. And I can guarantee you from that point forward, the learner will never forget that. Yeah. 
So, and, and this is just one example. You can really do that for any, any scenario. In that particular case, we run the, the same case often. It's helpful not to give them the labs too quickly. Let them spend some time with the patient being hypotensive and treating them and, and don't be too quick to give them all the information because it, it, it helps them anchor on it a little bit more. Great okay. point. Yeah. Great point. Mark, you, you had a point? Well, you know, a lot today people use uh, their pocket computers, their phones to like look up things to aid their memory. And there are certain things that, you know, sort of keep in your head because you don't have time to go to the phone. Like if, whether it's the five H's or the five T's on a person who's in cardiac arrest and that you should as a group at least go through them in your mind or you have a metabolic acidosis. So you think about, you know, mnemonics like mud piles to try to remember the things that you don't see very often, but they're one of the causes. And the fact that you're in a scenario here where you look around and the leader is not necessarily the best diagnostician in the group is as the role of the leader. But you ask to others, you know, what do you think? Is there, does anyone else have thoughts on this? So everyone now has to refresh and, you know, hopefully store in their head, you know, some of these key scenario findings. Um, so I think that's very powerful. And do you see people get mired down in confirmation bias and does it, does it happen fairly quickly uh, in some of these scenarios? And do you see sort of a, a series of aha moments afterwards? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. You know, especially if you can record it and then play it back to the learners, let, let them look at it at the end. You, know, you don't have to say a word, you just let them watch it and a light bulb goes off. Very good. Thank you. So why don't we move to our, our um, next uh, next scenario? But before we do, I do want to remind people uh, we we will have time for Q and A. So please do keep the Q and A coming. Uh, we want to we want to address your questions. So medication errors. Medication errors are um, for those in risk management. This is going to be a hot topic, of course, because medication errors account for 1.3 million. Uh, preventable injuries to patients nationwide annually, I believe is the last, last number that, uh, that our research showed. So it's, it's a major, major issue. And of course, it's a major issue among um, new clinicians um, across the board. So medication errors, what are you doing to let people know about the gravity of this issue? And how are you training them for this? How are you introducing them to this topic? So I'll, I'll take this one. So we have a, a pretty good case that we've been doing for a while. It's a patient who's admitted to the hospital who gets an antibiotic that they're allergic to. They subsequently develop a, an allergic reaction and they start to decompensate quickly. We go into anaphylactic shock. They become hypotensive. Their airway starts to swell. Um, it's an interdisciplinary sim, ideally. So we have nursing students there with medical students or residents. Um, the patient eventually needs epinephrine. Inevitably, they'll correctly order the epinephrine, but they'll forget to order the root, perhaps, or the dose. And the nursing students will just draw up epinephrine, and more times than not, they'll give it IV rather than IM, because no one really specified the root. So it's just, it, and it happens over and over again, right, Drew? Like, we've been running this case for years, and it, pretty predictable what's going to happen. So it's a, it's a great case for bringing out the importance of how to order medications, the importance of communication, of readbacks, for instance. Um, so. And that was going to be a, a question of mine. You're using team steps. So are you, you teaching your new residents team steps or your nurses, uh, also your nurses as well, you're teaching them team steps in this, in this process. And are you doing the, the teach backs or, or the read closed back. loop communications yeah. to, or the lead backs to make sure that, that, okay, what I just ordered here is what you've understood and so forth. Yeah. And we've done it both ways where there have been times where we've taught them those steps before they've gone through the simulation. And other times we just allow the simulation to serve as the backdrop to why these steps are important. And it doesn't matter, honestly, whether they know it or not until they practice it and demonstrate it back you won't correct those, those errors. So I think it emphasizes how important it is to go through the exercises and, and make those mistakes and see the mistakes that can be uh, made. 
and epinephrine is a perfect drug for it because there's different concentrations, as you know, and different routes of administration, and it's confusing to the students. So it's a good one to use for this. Yep. So that would, I was about to ask if you had any advice, and so that would maybe be part of your advice to use epinephrine in, in this particular case, just to, to start to introduce the subject. Any other advice you would recommend you would give people online that want to replicate this type of scenario? If it's in, in an unstable situation, then they don't have time to look something up. So like in this person who has anaphylactic shock, they don't have time to go to their, their phone or to, to call a pharmacy, for instance, or do something else. So. Sure. Mark, go ahead. You know, um, as much as we can, we like to do things in, in situ. So as David said, when you need the epinephrine for anaphylactic shock, you need it right away. So this is our one of our trauma rooms where this scenario and the previous one's taken place. It's our residency director in the back there who's been recording um, the, the scenario. And we have nurses there and CAs and we have our code carts. So reaching for, where is the equipment? What is it that I exactly need? And as much as possible, it's important to um, use the same kind of equipment in the sim lab because, uh, and keep it consistent from room to room in the emergency department. So if you are the person there and you have to reach for it, there's no one to help. You know where to go. You know the fact that you got two different uh, d uh, doses of epinephrine in the co code cart for different ways of administration. And uh, it just reinforces, it reinforces your actions in the future. Excellent. Thank you, doctor. So next we're going to move on to um, equipment and processors. My favorite is the situation where someone doesn't realize that the uh, defibrillator is, is plugged in, resting on the crash cart. They move the crash cart and the defibrillator goes on the floor. What, what are you doing to teach people the importance of knowing their, knowing how to use the equipment, where the uh, equipment is in a room, and then also uh, process errors. And I don't know if you want to comment on anything that you're seeing here in the, uh, in the photo, but how do you establish simula uh, your simulations to teach these, these concepts? Mark touched on it a little bit, one by doing them in situ. So we're actually using our our equipment in our, the environment that they'll be practicing in. But I think that's key, um, key to that. And we've run simulations that require the use of a lot of the equipment. So whether it be the Lucas or the defibrillator, we have that around, not necessarily readily available. So I'll have to find it and hook it up. And okay. Use it. Also, as part of the July course, it's sort of a fun thing. We'll have, we'll give them a couple hours. We'll call it a scavenger hunt and give them a list of equipment that they have to locate in the ED. So it's just, they'll, they'll walk around and they'll try to locate certain pieces of equipment, write down where it was, and then come back to us. Andrew, any, uh, any thoughts? Go ahead. Yeah, we, we uh, you know, maybe try to have a little fun with the residents sometimes as well, and we'll purposefully malfunction the equipment. Um, so it sort of forces them to go through their checklist. You know, perhaps they're preparing to, to intubate a patient. Um, we'll um, uh, uh, mess around with the uh, cuff on the uh, tube, for instance. If they didn't go through the steps of making sure that the cuff was, was working appropriately, they'll find out afterwards. So there, there are lots of little tricks you can go that help, that'll help to uh, remind people how important all those, those steps are. I've seen uh, even um, just a, a very small puncture in a BVM. You so that it's that it's just not it's just not functioning. So any any advice in in this realm? If uh, do you have uh, do you recall any aha moments that would that you'd want to pass on to someone else so that they could replicate it? We've already mentioned just a few, but anything really stick out that where you said this one's you you just got to do in a simulation? I, I think that for this, it, it really is just the whole experience, the in situ experience where. Everybody gets a sense of what they really know. You know, they, they may think they understand how to work the monitors, but then when push comes to shove, they, they don't. They don't realize what all the buttons are for and, and now understand that, okay, I have to step back and take some time to really get more familiar with this. Sure. 
and, and sure. as far as process errors go, having the whole team working together with, you know, CAs, nurses, residents, physician assistants, everybody, it, it, that's key. Because then you sort of have a better understanding of everyone's role. Yes. All right. Very good. Thank you. So now we're going to get to the, the two that everybody's been waiting for that they rated so high in the, in the polling questions. So the first one is communications and teamwork. And I, I have to cite my um, favorite statistic that 80% of patient harm is connected to a breakdown in communications and then 70% is, is typically related to um, a breakdown in teamwork. So describe to us how you're teaching good teamwork and communication skills in a particular scenario that, that you might recommend people repeat out there. Oh, Andrew, th those numbers don't surprise me. You know, they, they sound high, but when you practice in healthcare, you figure out pretty quickly that that's-, that's the Source fact. is the joint commission on that one, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a, a, a smart bunch. Um, so so we, we have a, a, uh, a, a snare that we often use. It's a, um, it's a pregnant woman who's uh, 36 weeks pregnant and unfortunately is involved in a high-speed MVA. And she comes in, you know, very traumatized, including a tension pneumothorax and a, a, a femur fracture. So it involves you inviting in lots of different specialists to help care for this patient. And if there's any way to really emphasize leadership, teamwork, communication skills, it's to get multiple folks from different specialties involved. And you can run this scenario in many different ways. You know, oftentimes the first version of this will run where the specialist will be um, cooperative. And even in that setting, it's difficult to get everyone on the same page. And then you can ramp it up and you can have one of the specialists be sort of dysfunctional and, you know, be very in, uh, into, you know, just stabilizing the femur fracture and preventing anyone else from dealing with the other parts to it. So you really teach your, your, your learners how to step up into that, that leadership role. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, David, looked like you might want to say something, but... I think they all, I think the beauty of sim simulation is that all these things tie together. So communications and teamwork can be relevant in just about any, any simulation scenario. So it, it becomes part of the fabric rather yeah. than one particular yeah. scenario. Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. The next topic then, um, which, which was the all-star topic, is culture of safety. How are you importing either as part of the fabric or, or particular simulation. And we'll, we'll take, we'll give this one to you, Mark, but how are you imparting a culture of safety and embedding that into um, people's um, character, their psyche, their, their whole approach to delivering care there at Stony Brook? Go ahead, Mark. Well, I just wanted to point out that this particular slide shows a debriefing and people have stopped and they're going over what they just learned and, and here's the idea that you should, you know, critique your actions. How did we do? How did we do individually? How did we do as a team? Um, it's, it's thinking about near misses as well as mishaps uh, and acknowledging them as opportunities to improve. And how do people respond to those debriefings? Do you find that um, I mean, it could run the gambit, right? It could run the, I didn't do that, or I didn't, don't remember that. And, and by the way, are you showing film during these debriefings? That's, that, that is an important question. Go ahead, Mark. Well, I just want to add that one of our steps on cardiac arrest um, that we check off on the arrest sheet is the debriefing. Okay. It's, it's built into Excellent. what we do when we have a code. So to the point of going back to, to my question where I was going with that, do you find people more engaged as a result of debriefing? And do you think they'd be less, it's, I'm leading a little bit and I apologize for that, but do you, do, would you agree that people would be less engaged if they didn't do the debriefing? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think the, the debriefing is really the most important part to create that culture of safety. If it becomes an expectation that you're going to criticize every single case, you know, to try to make it better, you know, it's, it's, we don't expect people to be perfect, 
but we want to look at what's not and, and to try to get to that point next time. It makes people feel much more comfortable, much more willing to, to speak out and try to elevate the uh, entire team. Sure. And Excellent. when I think about, you know, safety, it's really important that every member of the team feel comfortable speaking when they see something that's not right or something they're not comfortable with. So by doing like in this picture, for instance, we have paramedics, doctors, nurses, people of all levels that are there that we're, we're sort of telling them it's OK to say something. If, they, if the attending or whoever you perceive to be in charge is doing something you're not comfortable with, by all means, speak up, please. That's how these things get you know, solved or prevented. Well, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And it's great to see the, the program you have. And it, I want to say thank you before we, before we continue to audience questions. I want to thank you for sending all these great photos because all the photos you've seen, uh, most, most everyone you've seen uh, uh, since the beginning has, has been from Stony Brook and shows what's actually gone, going on in Stony Brook. And it's fantastic what you all are doing. So let's take some audience questions. I'm going to uh, go through these. There's quite a few that came in about interdisciplinary training. And I'm, for those that ask the, ask the questions around this, I am going to combine the question. And I hope you don't mind my doing that. So we've talked about simulations that you recommend for your new re residents, but when it comes to interdisciplinary uh, training, how do you create buy-in for the interdisciplinary training? Is that a tough thing to do to, to get everybody together? How are you creating buy-in? It can be a little tricky. I, I feel like in, in our environment, the hardest thing to get interdisciplinary training is getting everybody's schedule to work out together. I find the, the buy-in is more there. I think people realize the importance to it. But the schedule is tough. But if you can get one of these going and get the, um, the important players involved, you know, the, the heads of the various departments to see how it plays out, you'll get buy-in really quick because they'll see how much how and that's why the in situ sims work out so well because then it takes the it makes the scheduling piece a little bit easier. It's a great point. We can do them perhaps you know during a slow shift, for instance, or a slow part, slower part of the day. Excellent. That's uh, the in situ is is uh, great advice because in so many so many hospital complexes are so large and. Um, the sim lab is is only in one location, right? It's in, it's, it's in situ allows it to be everywhere. I, I do want to come back to to this because I do want to make sure that I, I don't gloss over it. In, uh, for interdisciplinary sim scenarios, is there one you we we we've I, we saw cardiac arrest here. Um, and you've mentioned some other sims, but if there was one that came to your mind that was, in your opinion, the ideal interdisciplinary sim scenario, what would it be, please? I mean, my, I mean, I have so many favorites. I mean, I think the one that comes to mind immediately is the uh, epinephrine case that we talked about okay. before, because it's so important to have that communication between the physicians and the nurses to be solid. And when it's not, you can see how things fall out. But um, it's certainly not limited to that case. So many of them are, are useful in that sense. Do you use any newborn scenarios for your new residents? Okay, very good. Um, and someone gave, uh, said that they're doing a class weekly with um, Sim Baby. So thank you. Really appreciate that. Uh, what, are, what are your newborn scenarios like? Well, those are great scenarios because again, you know, most deliveries, for instance, are very natural and there's not a lot you have to do. So you're sort of lulled into the sense of normalcy. So it's the rare abnormal situations that, that come about. The a child is born apneic um, and now folks that aren't necessarily all that comfortable taking care of that particular patient population have to get good at it. They might not be familiar with the equipment with the medication doses. And, and that's when the simulation experience can be so, so helpful. And, and those, they teach you something about your, your system, how to make things easier for that, that. And those events are so infrequent that simulating them is even that much more important. I mean, that, that's the beauty of it. Okay. Um, here's one. How, um, how did you manage 
con keeping the program moving forward during COVID? Hmm. Yeah, that was tricky. We, um, we ended up doing a lot of these um, through uh, virtual training. You know, we would have some folks in the room running it, wearing full PPE, where others would be um, sort of managing it from a distance. Very complicated. You know, it, it worked. I, I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm not looking forward to the days as we are progressing back to a sense of normal again. Sure. sure. We, we did a number of things. We tried to do them via Zoom. So we would have a patient monitor in one corner of the screen, and then we'd have the participants on Zoom. And it, it, it was it worked, but I don't think it was the same as having them there in the in the room. Did it change anything in your current approach, or at this point you're just trying to return back to normal? Were there were there any lessons learned that you're applying going forward? Well, I think some of the lessons were that it, it can be done. I, I still think the in person is is best. But let's face it, sometimes the way the schedule is, you can't get everybody in, in the room together. And certainly it's, it's a good second option. I think for the didactics, it's, it's fine. And in some, in some ways it's better because we had a lot of faculty that were willing to give lectures this year that otherwise their schedule would have prevented. So in, in that respect, for that part of it, I thought it was great. So this next question is, is similar in a sense, virtual reality. So we're, we're talking virtual, right? Are you doing anything with virtual reality? Are you experimenting with it, looking we're, at it? We're really just beginning to look at that. We haven't had a lot of experience in that, that area yet, but it's something that we are looking forward to. Okay, very good. We're getting some really good questions here. Um, if you wanted to obtain simulations for pediatric populations, both uh, nursing and interdisciplinary focused. Do you have any suggestions? Or maybe I'm gonna rephrase this question. So for, for pediatric scenarios, so why don't, uh, if I hope um, the person that wrote this doesn't mind my simplifying this just a little bit. Do you have any recommendations on a pediatric scenario, preferably an, inter, inter, an interdisciplinary one? And then do you have any suggestions on where to go if somebody wanted to look further for pediatric sims? I find a, a, a good source for a lot of simulation is the MedEd portal. There's an, an awful lot published there. It's, it's free. Um, and you can create your own simulations and publish them up there as well. It's considered academic work. So I, I would look there. You'll find an awful lot of scenarios. The ones we use, we like... Um, we have the uh, epiglottitis one that we use. Epiglottitis is a great case. We've done um, uh, trauma cases with kids, especially like child abuse type cases. Those can be, um, you know, very difficult cases at times to run. Uh, sepsis in the, um, in the neonate is, is another popular scenario. Okay. And, and uh, I'd also, oh, go ahead, please, Mark. Well, you know, toxicology cases are good because the little ones put a lot of stuff in their mouth. So insecticides is a good one where they get into insecticide and you have to treat as if it's a nerve agent poisoning. And, and unfortunately, um, prescription drugs, yeah, to, yeah, which well. has become a major, major, major issue amongst uh, peds. So I'd also like to invite that person to um, reach out to their Lairdal uh, representative because we, we certainly can help someone with uh, pre-programmed scenarios for pediatrics. So we're, we're here to help and you'll hear more about that in just, just a moment. Um, how do, we, back to the scenario where, where it's a diagnosis scenario, where you're, where you're evaluating the patient, how do you keep your scenarios from channeling people down rabbit holes as, as it were? So you set up a scenario where there seems to be two choices, but, uh, do you see people going in wild directions that you never imagined? We do. You know, I mean, that most of the time, I mean, I should say it doesn't happen quite as much as you'd expect it to happen. Most people follow similar pathways, but you definitely have to be ready for some alternative directions. The, the beauty of the equipment, you know, we, we use the, the uh, Laird all mannequins. The beauty of the equipment is you can really change the parameters pretty quickly on the fly. You can program them in if you desire. But if you want to work with them on the fly, you can do that too. So you, you can make quick adjustments based on that. Very good. You know, uh, go ahead, Mark. One case, one case that, you know, points some of this out is, you know, it's a two or three month old who comes in 
with respiratory distress and there's some uh, history of the apartment being sprayed for roaches and the baby gets intubated because at the first place, um, but then gets transferred to the ICU at a children's hospital and is still not improving the oxygenation. Now they know the history, they have the insecticides history and they've intubated. Uh, and you die of two ways from this poisoning. Either you're paralyzed and you can't breathe, which intubation and vents take care of, or you drown in your own secretions. And they got to move to giving the atropine to clear up the secretions in the lungs. And it turns out that, you know, you say, wash the skin. How does a baby two months old you put, crawl around, put something in the mouth? But you could have a scenario where the pot was on the stove when they sprayed. And then the formula was put in the pot, warmed up, and after that, the child got sick. So it forces people, you know, they've gone down one path, it's correct. And in a lot of the scenarios, um, you may have to do two or three critical steps in order for the person to be recoverable. And it points out that just because you did one thing wrong, uh, right doesn't mean there's a, not another step to do. Sure, sure. That's a way kind of the, the uh, oral exams are done in emergency medicine where you're supposed to show that you can recognize the need for and talk through critical steps on a scenario. All right, very good, thank you. I think we have room for uh, two more questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Do you find that recording scenarios takes away from a feeling of a safe learning environment for people? Go yeah. ahead, Andrew. You have to be careful with that. So um, what, what we'll do is we'll emphasize to our learners that this material is recorded. It's only used for the purpose of education. And in some situations, we'll even tell them that we will destroy it after this particular case. Um, and I find a lot of times when learners first start getting into it, they're still a little apprehensive about it. They often forget that they're being recorded very quickly. And after you've used the recording just a few times in the debriefing exercise and they see the power behind it, that all goes away. All right, thank you. Last but not least, uh, in your in-situ sims, do you give people advance notice that they're going to participate in an in-situ sim or is it here you are and we are starting a scenario? We've done them both ways. Um, during this July course, a lot of them, they, they already know it's going to be an institute kind of sim. Um, but many times it will just be we show up, we'll say code T, and then everyone runs and then they like, oh, it's a simulation. So we've done, we've done both. Very good. Thank you. So we're going we're gonna to have to unfortunately wrap, wrap this up. I wish we had more time. Uh, questions continue to come in, but... Uh, we, we know that you're all on a time schedule. So I'd like to close by, um, first of all, thanking all of you, Dr. Henry, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Wackett, you've, you've all been great. And for the audience, um, these are three special people that, uh, that you've been listening to. Uh, they, they have been so helpful in putting this together and, and coordinating all of this so that we could bring you this content today. We're truly humbled that you could, could join us um, we, we're inspired. Uh, this isn't the first time you've appeared on one of our sessions, but uh, we're, we're inspired every time uh, we have an opportunity to, to be with all of you. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with our audience today. We, we truly appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. For everyone watching on, online, uh, we're here to help. So if you are interested in mitigating risk in your hospital, if you're interested in embarking on a program or continuously improving your current program that may be similar to what uh, Stony Brook is doing in an emergency medicine or in any area of your hospital, or if you'd like to even bring that to your um, medical or nursing education program, we're here to help. Please give us a call and you're gonna see some, some resources come up on the next on the next slide. You can call us at 877 Lairdall. Certainly find us at lairdall.com. Check out our resources for COVID. Our, our, um, please watch for our next sun session, like the one that you viewed today. We've got another one coming up. Um, 
shortly. And also consider joining our Sun Facebook group. That's a great group to, to get mutual support in growing your simulation program. If you've got questions there that uh, you'd like to pose to other peers and experts in the field of simulation, that's the place to go. So we hope you'll join and uh, we hope you'll, uh, you'll hope, we hope you'll benefit from that. Again, thanks everyone. Thank you, Dr. Wackett, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Henry. Thank you to our audience and uh, make sure you all have a great day. Remember, humans are over overrated. So thanks very much. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.